Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Charts with Dan. Today, we are talking about the second week of Dune. It didn't hold up certainly as much as I had hoped. Is it the Halloween weekend? We're going to look at the numbers for HBO Max. We're also going to look at the box office numbers for Edgar Wright. His latest film, Last Night in Soho, also debuted this weekend. We've got the streaming charts, you name it. Before we get to any of that, however, I want to once again point out that you can not only watch this on YouTube, but you can also listen to everything that I'm doing on YouTube on the Dan Merle Audio Podcast channel. You can find the links for all of the different platforms down in the description below. You're also going to get some, uh, from time to time, uh, different audio exclusive reviews and maybe some other audio exclusives. And I've gotten some feedback from people saying, well, you know, are you going to start doing, uh, you know, split your programming, etc." The The vast majority of the programming is still going to be here on YouTube, but I'm also trying to grow the audio side as well. And uh, the reviews are generally ones for movies that I don't think would have had a huge splash. I'm not going to make my Eternals review you uh, a audio exclusive for example uh, keep in mind also that all my movies is still going to return at some point it's very possible that it's going to be on that channel as well still trying to work out some details there as far as where exactly that is going to live it will be under my control regardless of where it goes uh, but there's still a lot of things to do on the audio channel so I'd love it if you became an audio subscriber as well you can take me on the go listen in the car I know the YouTube app can be a little weird uh, as far as locking your phone etc so I would love for you to also become an audio subscriber subscriber. Having said that, let's go to the weekend charts. And as expected, Dune was the number one movie for the second week in a row. It didn't hold up great uh, at the box office. In its second week, Dune dropped about 62%, which is uh, a steeper drop than I think many people would have liked. Now, one thing to note is that this was Halloween weekend, uh, particularly Friday night and Saturday night. Uh, and for people with kids, even last night on Sunday, uh, there were a lot of Halloween activities, a lot of things that would be keeping people out of movie theaters for a lot of people this was their return to Halloween festivities after taking the year off in 2020 no doubt that took some people out of the theaters but the question has been raised and I read it in several uh, press uh, clippings and coverages of this weekend uh, about HBO Max and the, the 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 fact that it was available to stream was that keeping people out of the theater so I wanted to kind of look at the numbers on HBO Max uh, and particularly looking at movies that opened at number one one. So, you know, the headlining movies, how much did the ones that were on HBO Max drop off uh, in 2021 and also going back to Wonder Woman 1984 last year? And also, what do those drops look like when you look at some other averages? So this is kind of a, uh, a complexly titled chart, but these are HBO Max films that opened at number one. Uh, so these are just the number one openers. Uh, their week two drop-offs compared to the averages of movies that were not on HBO Max. So you can see here, The Suicide Squad opened at number one. It had the steepest week two drop-off of any HBO Max film uh, at 71%. That was followed very closely by Space Jam A New Legacy at 69%. Wonder Woman 1984 dropped 67%. And then you see there, uh, Dune at 62%. So it was the fourth steepest drop-off for any HBO Max film that opened at number one. However, you can see right there next to Dune, the average drop-off for a film available on HBO Max that opened at number one is 62%. So Dune falls right into that average. In addition, I looked at the average drop-off for all movies this year that were available on streaming. Uh, so that would be the day and dates for Disney, uh, meaning Black Widow, Raya and the Last Dragon, etc., Halloween Kills. Uh, in addition to HBO Max, the average for all movies that were available on streaming services as well as in theaters is 60%. So Dune is only slightly above average uh, for films that were also available on streaming services. Godzilla vs. Kong and the third Conjuring film both dropped at 57%. The Little Things also dropped 56%. And then you see there that red bar, the average for a theatrically released film that opened at number one. So these are movies that were not available on streaming services. Theatrical only is 54%. So that's what we're really looking at uh, this year to date and of course there are always x factors but for movies that were available on hbo max day and date and open number one they have dropped an average of 62 percent in their second weeks for movies that were available on hbo max and any other streaming service day and date they average a week two drop off of 60 percent 
And for movies that were only available in theaters in 2021, they average a drop off in their second week of 54%. It does appear that the HBO Max day and date releases, as well as the streaming releases for films, uh, on average are affecting the second week drop offs, but they're not by uh, a margin of 10 or 20%. It looks like we're looking at the single percentage points, at least on average. Now you can always point to different movies and these movies play, etc. There are arguments to be made for each movie on a case by case basis. But on average, uh, there is an effect, but it's not a huge effect. I think um, if you're looking at Dune's numbers, and, and, and it's going to be interesting to see what it does this next week, because it's facing, obviously, massive competition from Returnals. It's going to lose most of, if not all, of its IMAX screens, which is a big draw for people. And it's also going to be in its third week. The question being, is it going to recover some of that business? Are there people that didn't go to the movies this weekend because they were busy with Halloween plans that are going to go back and see Dune? Or uh, was it just sort of a bad timing where a uh, Dune comes out, uh, you have an off week due to Halloween and people going out and doing other stuff, and then the next weekend, everybody's sort of turned their attention to Eternals. That could have uh, an effect on Dune's bottom line. Now, that sequel, the Dune sequel, which was the basis of last week, show uh, that was shortly thereafter greenlit. I was I was very happy to see that, mainly because I'd said on the show that I thought that there would be an announcement soon, so I, I didn't look like a dummy if they'd come out the next day and said, uh, yeah, no, we're not doing it. Uh, so we are going to get a Dune sequel, but the big thing being, we don't yet know exactly what form that's going to take. We know it's going to come out in a couple of years, but is it going to be one movie? Is it going to be two movies? We don't know yet. My suspicion, and I'm and and and, and I'm he hesitant to make forecasts because I often, um, you know, am wrong. Uh, but you know, that's part of the job. If I were to guess, my guess is we're going to get one more Dune movie that uh, wraps up the story. And I know that the Dune enthusiasts uh, may not be particularly happy with that, but looking at the overall box office performance, and we'll see where it settles out worldwide, we'll see where it settles out domestically, I think that it was already a leap of faith for Legendary and Warner Brothers to move forward with another Dune movie, uh, and that people are going to take the goodwill from this movie, that the theatrical marketplace will have recovered to a, a place where it is going to be um, financially viable. I think it's a leap of faith to make one more. I wonder if they're going to have that same courage and the same ability to stake so much money on making two more films, not to mention the fact that you have a big cast. You would have to reassemble if you're going to do another break between movies. Um, maybe they're going to say, hey, we're filming one big movie that we're going to split into two parts, part two and part three. But my guess would be that we're going to get a Dune part two, which wraps up the rest of the story. I could very well be wrong, but based on the results that I'm seeing, um, that would be my guess. Let's look at the rest of the weekend top five. Halloween Kills, after a big drop in its second week, uh, actually held not too terrible in its third week. It dropped 39%. Obviously, a lot of people probably going to see that for the holiday. Also, because it did drop off so drastically in its second week, it had less uh, distance to cover in its third week. No Time to Die eases 36%. So you can see in the top five there, uh, also uh, Venom Let There Be Carnage only dropped 38%. Dune having the biggest drop off of any movie. Of course, it all also opened uh, at, with the highest box office last week, so that's not terribly surprising. My Hero Academia World Heroes Mission takes the fourth spot. It's another sign that anime continues to be uh, growing in popularity uh, at the box office. I remember probably three or four or five years ago, uh, something like this, uh, a My Hero Academia movie, would have been a specialty release, would have been a Fathom event or something like that. My Hero Academia played in 1,500 theaters, uh, which was half the size or less of a uh, many of the other movies in the top 10. It had a $4,000 per theater average, which was the highest gross, actually second highest per theater average that I can see on the chart uh, for this entire weekend. Uh, so it continues to draw uh, good crowds to the theaters that are booking these films. Of course, we saw with Demon Slayer uh, a huge success earlier this year, both domestically and worldwide. And we continue to see uh, this uh, expansion of the anime brand in the anime format worldwide because uh, a top five debut for an anime film, something that would have been huge news just 
three or four years ago, uh, now seeming more and more like a, a commonplace event. There were two other new releases, however, that didn't even place in the top five, and they actually flip-flopped places once the actual numbers came in. In sixth place was Antlers, which is produced by Guillermo del Toro. Uh, the original reports had it in seventh place, but it actually came in sixth with $4.2 million. And again, this is not a Guillermo del Toro directed film, but they did throw his name because he was a producer on the film. Uh, they, they kind of used the del Toro brand. Let's break down the top five openings for films that had Del Toro's name attached as a producer. Number one is Pacific Rim with $37.2 million. He did direct that film. Number two is the sequel, Pacific Rim Uprising, which he did not return to direct at $28.1 million. Number three is Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, which he produced but did not direct at $20.9 million. Number four, uh, The Book of Life, an animated film, which again, he produced but did not direct at $17 million. And then uh, another film that he did direct, Crimson and peak at 13.1 million dollars so uh the guillermo del toro name uh valuable not only in the directing realm but also in the producing realm antlers could not replicate the success of those other films uh it was a fairly small budget uh, i actually enjoyed the film quite a bit if you want to hear my take on antlers you can go to the audio channel uh because i had an audio exclusive review of that film and i paired it with the audio from my youtube review of the film that came in seventh place this weekend a bit of a personal disappointment for me, which was last night in Soho, the latest from one of my favorite directors, if not my favorite director working today, Edgar Wright. Uh, it could not place in the top five. And looking at Edgar Wright's opening uh, weekends domestically, uh, number one was Baby Driver, a summer hit uh, a few years ago with $20.5 million. Number two was Scott Pilgrim vs. the World at $10.6 million, which was still a box office disappointment at the time. Number three was uh, The World's End, which wrapped up the Cornetto trilogy at $8.8 .8 million. Hot Fuzz opened with $5.8 million. That put it at number four on this chart. And then last night in Soho, despite the growth of the Edgar Wright name over these last several years, uh, only good enough to come in fifth on Edgar Wright's domestic opening weekends with just over uh, $4.1 million. So I'm sure, you know, they had the PR spend, et cetera, and the studio focus saying, hey, this was the uh, result that we wanted. We took a chance. We put uh, a more quote unquote specialty film into wide release. But I, I just find it hard to believe that this was the exact result that they wanted. I certainly would have hoped that it would have done better. Uh, Last Night in Soho also having a, a budget reportedly of 40 plus million dollars right now that the world wide gross uh, is uh, just over six million dollars it is a movie that's gonna roll out slowly but uh, it's gonna be a bit of a tough path I think it's it's not gonna be one of those movies that makes money in the theatrical window perhaps uh, when you're selling it to potential streaming services home video etc then uh, it could break even but uh, you know I'm one of those guys I love Edgar Wright I love his style I liked last night in Soho but I'm always rooting for that breakout hit baby driver kind of was it wasn't a massive summer hit but it was a it was was a popular summer film and um, I was kind of hoping that that would launch his name uh, a little higher into the stratosphere but uh, last night in Soho a tough sell to a lot of moviegoers here domestically so not able to crack the top 10. This was not the week that the box office was able to top week by week the 2019 box office. We see on this chart here 2019 is the blue line uh, and we did not go above that line. In fact the, the box office took a big dip uh, which it has been doing steadily uh, since the debut a few weeks ago of Venom Let There Be Carnage uh, even with the presence of No Time to Die. So now we turn to this week uh, coming up. Will this be the week where the box office is able to top where we were week to week uh, for 2019 uh, and you know all eyes now turning to Eternals uh, Eternals the next Marvel Studios film usually the answer would be well absolutely we're going to be able to top it because when you look at the combined box office total for the comparable weekend in 2019 it's 121 million dollars which some Marvel movies have been able to do on their own however we are in uncharted territory with Eternals right now. It is currently, as I st sit here talking right now, the only movie with a rotten rating uh, on Rotten Tomatoes in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's been flip-flopping back and forth between 59% and 60% uh, for the last few days. Between Rotten and Fresh, of course, there's going to be a whole flood of new reviews that hit once the movie opens. Mine will be one of them. Uh, sometimes those are more positive. Sometimes those are more negative. We don't know where the word's going to be. But we are looking, if you're Marvel, 
Marvel, uh, potentially at the f- the most mixed word of mouth, perhaps, of any film they've ever released. How is that going to affect the box office? Are we going to see a disappointing uh, box office take from Eternals this weekend coming up? There had been some strong indications uh, from pre-sales, etc., that we could be looking at a big number. Will the word get out that perhaps this isn't the movie to go see in theaters? I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things. Usually I can forecast a Marvel movie. Oh, it's going to do great. The question is just how great is it going to do? This, I don't know. There's so many X factors here that we haven't dealt with. So will this upcoming weekend be the one where we're able to overtake the 2019 total? I don't know. We'll have to see. It depends on Eternals. It depends on Dune. It depends on a lot of things. Uh, But some very interesting potential box office ground about to be covered uh, by Marvel Studios and Disney. Looking at the top per theater average, it belongs to The Souvenir Part 2, which is from writer-director Joanna Hogg. This movie is from A24, and it's actually a sequel. They've started a franchise. It's a sequel to a previous film called The Souvenir. Um, I guess this kind of makes The Souvenir the Avengers franchise of A24, which would make Tilda Swinton, who appears in both of these films, their Robert Downey Jr., uh, which I'm, I'm... totally okay with, even though she's already in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, An $8,000 per theater average, obviously a big drop off uh, from uh, the last uh, couple weeks, uh, but still for the theaters that were able to book uh, the Souvenir Part 2, brought in some people uh, through the doors, which is always a good thing. Looking at the top films in limited release, which are films that are in 1,000 theaters or fewer, it was a little bit feast or famine this week. Uh, The French Dispatch had a big expansion. It expanded to 788 theaters, which is still below that 1,000 theater threshold. It earned another $2.7 million. And then we have a huge drop-off. The second film was the documentary The Rescue in 101 theaters. In its fourth week, it made just over $50,000. The Michael Shannon sports uh, film Heart of Champions opened in 100 theaters. In its first week, it made $37,000. The A24 film Lamb in its fourth week dropped to 145 theaters and made $36,790. And then we see The Souvenir Part 2 in just three theaters. So by far, the fewest theaters of any movie on this list able to come in at number five with $26,485 total. Looking outside the domestic marketplace, let's look at the top five movies internationally. And No Time to Die, mainly because it debuted in China this past weekend where it grossed around $30 million, uh, returns to the number one spot with another $51.9 million. Dune is at number two, but it actually ties, according to uh, the the numbers that were reported from Comscore, with Venom Let There Be Carnage. So we have a tie for second place on the international charts, both films reporting $21.4 million. The Battle at Late Chongjin uh, staying on the chart at number four with just over $19 million. And Halloween Kills at number five at $8.1 million. So when we combine the international marketplace uh, with the domestic marketplace, we get the top five films worldwide. And it was a pretty easy chart to make this week because they are the exact same five films in the exact same order. No Time to Die, number one worldwide at $59.6 million. Dune at number two with $36.8 million. Venom Let There Be Carnage because Dune still has more money to make in the domestic box office, drops to number three with $27.1 million. The Battle at Late Shangjin is number four still with just over $19 million. And Halloween Kills at number five with $16.8 million. And when we look at the Chinese market specifically, kind of a surprising announcement that was made this past week. Uh, three films were given release dates that I've said on the show many times that the, the hopes were kind of fading about whether or not they would get them. One of them is Jungle Cruise, which is getting a November 12th release in China. And then this upcoming weekend, uh, Snake Eyes, G.I. Joe Origins, and uh, Sony Pictures Vivo will both be getting Chinese releases as well. Uh, so again, as uh, happens so much, we don't get much uh, advance notice on when these releases are going to happen, but uh, two summer films here in the United States uh, and domestic markets that are getting Chinese release dates, of course, the question being, because some of these are already available on, you know, uh, digital release, etc., here and in other parts of the world, uh, how many people will be heading out to the theaters in China to see it, but, uh, you know, for those that were, like myself, thinking, well, I guess that these summer movies just aren't going to be dated, uh, we now have a 
a date for a few of them coming up in China. Still several like Space Jam A New Legacy, and then obviously Black Widow and Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings that have no release date announced and potentially no release date that are going to be announced. Uh, and again, their box office prospects, even if they were to get release dates, uh, diminish with every passing week because they are available in different formats for people that choose uh, to seek it out, uh, perhaps in a not-so-legal manner, uh, or have been elsewhere where it's playing, etc. So uh, we will see. Dwayne Johnson, uh, normally a pretty big international star, big enough, along with Emily Blunt, to propel Jungle Cruise to a bigger gross worldwide uh, if it does do well in China. I I don't know. My guess is it's not going to be a huge number. There really haven't been huge numbers so far in China for any uh, or many releases uh, post-COVID. The other one to look at, though, is Venom Let There Be Carnage, which was a huge moneymaker in China, the original one back in 2018. Um, This movie, you would think, might be as well. Still no release date for that or several of the other movies that are opening now, including Eternals. So a lot of question marks about the Chinese market when certain movies are going to be released. But some of the older movies uh, that we've already seen and have already come through our doors now hitting China in the coming weeks. Let's look at the 2021 chart domestically to see what the top 10 films are. And we have a couple of things that moved here on the chart. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings remains number one, but Venom, Let There Be Carnage, uh, takes over the number two spot from Black Widow, dropping Black Widow down to third. F9 and A Quiet Place Part Two remain at numbers four and five. No Time to Die moves up one spot, surpassing the gross of Free Guy. So it is now number six. Free Guy is at number seven. Jungle Cruise is at number eight. Godzilla vs. Kong is at number nine and Cruella still sitting at that number 10 spot. Halloween Kills, however, is nipping at Cruella's heels. Less than half a million dollars difference there, and so it will take over that number 10 spot next week. Looking at the 2021 worldwide chart, The Battle at Lake Shangjin is the new number one movie worldwide at the 2021 box office with an $852 million gross uh, and really still going, so we could very well see this break $900 million. High Mom drops down one spot to number two, but still with an $841 million gross. F9 stays at number three, followed by Detective Chinatown 3. No Time to Die has broken the $600 million barrier only the second non-Chinese film uh, to do that uh, post-COVID. Godzilla vs. Kong is at number six. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings falls to number seven. Venom, Let There Be Carnage moves up one spot to number eight, dropping Black Widow down to number nine. And Free Guy remains on the chart at number ten. Before we look at what people are watching through the various streaming services, I love to take a look back at a weekend from Box Office Past. And we're actually going to look at a year that encompassed the same Halloween weekend phase that we just went through, October 29th through the 31st, 2004. That saw The Grudge at number one in its second week at 21.8, a very popular remake of the Japanese horror film. Uh, at number two was Ray with twenty, just over $20 million, almost in that number one spot. That would eventually win Jamie Foxx an Academy Award for Best Actor. At number three, the first Saw film. People, I, I, I often even sometimes forget just how, how strongly that franchise came out of the box office. $18.2 million, a great return on the small investment in that film. At number four was Shark Tale, which was in its fifth week with $7.5 million. And in its third week, the Richard Gere, Jennifer Lopez film, Shall We Dance, with $6.3 million. As we always do, let's close out the show by looking at what people are watching through the various streaming services. And we start with Amazon, where Stillwater has entered the rental window. It is the number one movie for the previous week. At number two is Free Guy. At number three, A Quiet Place Part Two. And at number four, Don't Breathe Two. All rentals, all holdovers from the previous chart. At number five, because of Halloween this past weekend, Hocus Pocus was rented by a lot of households. Halloween Town, uh, another Disney film, uh, a big hit with a younger generation than the one that probably first saw Hocus Pocus is at number six. Old and F9 are two carryovers uh, from last week at number seven and eight. At number nine, Coco, because we're also right at uh, the Day of the Dead, uh, a popular rental. And then at number 10, Trolls World Tour uh, coming back onto the charts. Turning now to iTunes, uh, Free Guy is still at the top spot, followed by Old and The Addams Family 2, which continues its run both in theaters and premium video on demand. Still Water, you can see, also coming into the top 10 uh, on the iTunes chart at number 4, followed by Beetlejuice, which was there last week. Scream, a popular Halloween rental on iTunes, comes in at number 6. Werewolves Within, which had a good specialty run earlier this year, was available as a 99-cent rental, so it comes in at number 7. 2018's Halloween is at number 
number eight. 1978's Halloween is at number nine. That's a new entry onto the chart. And at number 10, The Night House, uh, a popular option for purchase or rental. Looking at what people are watching on Netflix, let's look first of all at the overall Netflix chart. The spinoff film Army of Thieves, the most popular option here in the U.S. on Netflix. It's there at number one. You, the Netflix series, is at number two, followed by Squid Game and Made, two other Netflix series that stay on the chart. The Netflix movie Hypnotic is at number five, followed by Lock and Key and Maya and the Three, which are two Netflix series that are returning from last week. King Arthur Legend of the Sword may not have been very popular at the box office, but it was certainly popular on Netflix. It's there at number seven. At number nine in its 32nd consecutive week on the charts is Coco Melon. How it keeps succeeding like this is beyond me. Even though I've been doing charts for several years now, I've never seen a phenomenon like this. Like a particularly troublesome bank robber, Coco Melon is holding the charts hostage. Plenty of other shows have come and gone, and yet Coco Melon remains. Mainly, the biggest question that remains is just how long this is going to go on. Every success story has a hidden code, and Coco Melon is spelling out the first letter of the first word in each sentence of success right now. And at number 10, the Netflix biographical series of NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick, Colin in black and white, rounds out the overall chart. And finally, when we look at the Netflix movie chart, uh, Army of Thieves is there at number one, Hypnotic at number two, King Arthur, Legend of the Sword at number three, the Adam Sandler original Hubie Halloween, which shocked me last year by not being a garbage fire, returns at number four, followed by Monster House at number five, Army of Thieves, so popular, it brought back Army of the Dead from Zack Snyder into the overall top 10, probably also a popular Halloween choice. Uh, And then we have four holdovers from last week, Night Teeth at number seven, Scary Movie 4 at number 8, Going in Style at number 9, and Step Brothers at number 10. And that wraps up our look at this past weekend at the box office. Coming up, as we were talking about earlier, Eternals is hitting theaters. A lot of question marks about this movie's performance. It's the big story this week. Will the early reviews affect its box office performance? Also hitting streaming on Apple TV Plus is the Tom Hanks film Finch, which was previously known as Bios. It was delayed several times by COVID. It is from renowned Game of Thrones director Miguel Sapochnik. Also, Kristen Stewart's buzzy Oscar pick Spencer begins it's run in theaters a a princess diana biopic and i'll actually be heading out of town tomorrow to drive uh, a few hours to see spencer as well as another film from a24 called come on come on starring joaquin phoenix so i look forward to bringing you my thoughts on both of those movies very soon thank you so much for watching charts as i mentioned earlier i would love for you to also subscribe to the audio channel and if you want to see even more of what i'm up to you can check me out on patreon at patreon.com slash dan merle and i want to particularly thank these patrons these are my producers producer level patrons. It's the top tier over on Patreon. They help me do Schmodown study sessions. They also now are picking one movie every month. They get exclusive rights to pick one of the movies that we do for our monthly movie club. Uh, And they're also just a cool bunch of folks to hang out with and chat with. We have a community discord, uh, everybody comparing movies that they're watching and people talking about the Halloween and scary movies uh, stuff that they've been going through. Uh, It's so much fun and I'd love for you to come and join that community over there. But also thank you for watching me here. I will be back next week to talk Eternals. Also look later this week for my review of Eternals as well as potentially Spencer and Come On, Come On. Also stay tuned Also stay tuned soon for news about the return of the live show. Lots of exciting stuff coming up, and I'm happy that you're here with me. We're almost at 100,000. It's been a long journey, and uh, we're just going to keep going. Thanks for watching. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you next time. Bye.